Hey creeps, I'm Taylor and this is TGI Crime Day. Hello and welcome to TGI Crime Day. As I was wandering the aisles of my local library's true crime section, as one does, this book caught my eye. This is The Whistleblower by Katherine Bolkovic with Carrie Lynn. The back of this book says Nebraska police officer Catherine Bolkovac went to work for military contractor DynCorp hoping for a good salary, world travel, and the chance to rebuild war-torn Bosnia. But once in Sarajevo, she found that some of the peace-building officers that she had trusted were involved in human trafficking and forced prostitution. When she brought this evidence of their abuse to light, she was demoted and feared for her safety. This is the harrowing true story of how one woman risked everything to expose the truth. This book is incredible. Incredible. I cannot recommend this book enough. It is so well written. And Catherine, who I will be calling Kathy for the rest of this series, uh, because that's what all of her friends call her. And I feel like we are now BFFs after reading her book. She is absolutely incredible. A powerhouse of a woman and an absolute badass. I am going to stick to the most important details as much as I can as I tell you this story, but for sure, read the book so that you can hear all of the other bits and pieces in her own words. All of it is so interesting and so well written. Also, just a heads up, this is going to be a two-part case. Once I realized I had over 40 pages of notes, I was like, yeah, that's going to be... That's going to be too long. So it will be two parts. In part one, we are going to go over Kathy's background, how she got hired on by DynCorp as a contractor to work in Bosnia with the UN, and then we will get into some of the horrible, shocking corruption she saw happening left, right, and center, and how she was eventually fired, in the opinion of most people, myself included, for blowing the whistle on the boys club that had formed among the DynCorp members. And then in part two, we will talk about the aftermath and what updates I'm able to find about the people involved with the despicable load of crap that Kathy uncovered. And I am going to give you a trigger warning that this episode is going to talk a lot about human trafficking and forced prostitution, but I will not be going into any unnecessarily graphic detail. In 2001, a U.S. Senator from Kansas, Sam Brownback, who was a big advocate for the human rights causes that Kathy was working toward, said, quote, "...international sex trafficking is the new slavery." It includes the classic and awful elements associated with historic slavery, such as abduction from family and home, use of false promises, transport to a strange country, loss of freedom and personal dignity, extreme abuse, and deprivation. He also stated, quote, The biggest problem we face is to convince people that this is actually taking place, end quote. While Kathy worked in Bosnia, it seemed that for every person fighting for human rights, trying to do the right thing, There were five people going up against them and fighting to cover their own asses and taking advantage of a situation full of so much corruption, it's hard to wrap your head around. Before I get ahead of myself, let's go back to the beginning of Kathy's story. Catherine Bolkovac was born in 1961. Her grandfather moved to the U.S. from Croatia when he was 16 and got a job working in a steel mill in Ohio. While living in the U.S., he married a U.S.-born woman with Croatian roots, and together they moved to Nebraska and raised five sons. Kathy's grandfather rarely spoke of his life in Croatia. He didn't speak the language and he didn't teach it to his sons, telling them, quote, you are American, you speak English, end quote. And like many immigrant parents, he dreamt of giving his sons a life full of success in America. His five sons worked very hard, went to college, and most of them played football and had really successful careers. Kathy's parents met on a blind date and eloped shortly after and had four kids together. Kathy said that she was the typical middle child. She had one older sister and one younger sister who were close to her age, and then there was a 10-year gap, and then her parents had her youngest brother. Her parents raised Kathy to work hard, and they taught her that you should always do the right thing. Her dad and uncles always joked that Kathy got the family's quote-unquote linebacker shoulders, and Kathy was very athletically talented and strong. She played volleyball in high school, and she earned herself a scholarship to the University of Houston. Her dad worked as an industrial engineer, and her mom drove the morning school bus, worked part-time as a bank teller, and took care of the family farm. This was a family of very hard workers. Kathy loved working with her hands, and she helped out a lot on the farm as well. In her book, she tells a story about a time when her mom took her down to the local drugstore where some of the farmers from the town were kind of just hanging out, playing cards, and unwinding from a long day of work. Her mom said to them, quote, Anyone want to arm wrestle Kathy? She already beat all the boys in town, end quote. 
The farmers chuckled to each other, kind of thinking that she was joking, and they would humor her and let this girl arm wrestle them. But they were shocked when one by one, she beat each of them at arm wrestling, leaving them all out of breath and asking Kathy's mom, what the hell is in that milk? So basically from day one, Kathy was the coolest person in the world. Kathy went off to college in the late 70s on her volleyball scholarship, but she was only there for about six weeks before she went back to her hometown in Nebraska to marry her high school sweetheart. Obviously, with it being the late 70s, not every girl was going to college. That wasn't everyone's goals, and she wanted to start her life with this guy she loved. While a lot of people were definitely getting married fresh out of high school, on the day of Kathy's wedding, her dad pulled her aside and whispered to her that it wasn't too late to change her mind. I think he just wanted her to wait. He was trying to give her good advice. He wanted her to see what else was out there before settling down. But Kathy said that for what felt like the first time in her entire life, she didn't take her dad's advice and she went through with the wedding. Kathy and her husband had three kids together by the time they were just 23. And as the years went on, they realized that they didn't have much in common outside of their kids. And eventually they did get a divorce in the late 80s. Kathy talked about how it was really hard for her at that time. She was the first person in her entire extended family to get divorced. Also, it was the late 80s and it was still considered very scandalous. Again, I think she's a total badass, but she felt like a failure. She didn't know what she wanted to do next with her career, and now she was also figuring things out as a single mom. Also, quick side note, because we're talking about it, there is absolutely nothing wrong with you if you get divorced, okay? If you are a single parent, whatever your situation. Getting out of a relationship where everyone is unhappy while stressful and terrifying is such a healthy and brave thing to do and better than staying in a situation where everyone is absolutely miserable. And then both of the parents can move on to become their best badass selves like Kathy. Okay, just had to throw that in there in case you needed to hear it. Uh, moving on. Up until that point, Kathy's career was in the hotel industry. She had worked her way up and was working in hotel management when one day an opportunity came along that she had never really expected. In 1989, Kathy saw an ad for open positions in the Lincoln Police Department. She said, quote, I was familiar with guns, having gone on hunting trips with my dad, and I was a diehard fan of cop shows like Matlock, Magnum P.I., Police Woman, and Perry Mason. This was a world I wanted to be part of, end quote. Kathy went to an interview with Sergeant Jim Hawkins, and she left that interview thinking that Sergeant Hawkins was the coolest person she had ever met. He gave great advice, he was an incredible mentor, and he genuinely cared for the officers he worked with. She was offered a position with the Lincoln Police Department and attended the State of Nebraska Law Enforcement Academy, where she excelled in the physical activity training. Kathy said that 1989 felt like she was starting over. She felt like she was finally figuring things out and found a place that she belonged because she got along with the other officers so well. At the academy, she loved the physical aspects of learning takedown techniques, doing obstacle courses, climbing barricades. She excelled in these things. She was also great at close range shooting, but as the target got farther away, she would aim her best for the center of the target. But somehow, as the cardboard cutout would come back towards her, she always managed to land the shot right in the testicles of her cardboard cutout, earning her the nickname Ball Buster. All in good fun from her fellow officers in training. Soon after she graduated from the academy and began her career, she ended up with another nickname. Kathy and her partner were making an arrest, and this suspect refused to get out of his car, so Kathy removed him. This shocked the suspect, and he yelled at Kathy's partner, Who is this woman, Xena the Warrior Princess? That one definitely stuck around for a while. Eventually, her career as a street cop turned to focus on domestic abuse and sex crimes. She took several courses to certify in forensic science technology, crime scene management, advanced interview, and interrogation techniques. She said at this time, quote, I was placed on the Youth Aid Unit, now known as the Special Investigations Unit, and in my three years there, made over 60 felony arrests and had a 95% conviction rate of predators of women and children, end quote. Badass. Seriously. I love this woman. Eventually, what had been a relatively safe working environment became more and more dangerous as gang violence started to pop up in Lincoln. Officers were constantly being sent to calls of shotguns protruding from windows, shooting at houses across the street. There were full-on brawls and duels in the middle of the neighborhood, and there were never-ending domestic violence calls coming in. Kathy was injured multiple times on the job because things were getting more dangerous there. The most serious injury that happened was when she and her partner made an arrest on the third floor of an apartment building, and as they were walking the suspect out in handcuffs, they were attacked by someone else from behind. 
Kathy was thrown down two flights of stairs, where she cracked her head hard at the bottom of the stairs. She suffered a pretty major concussion and was rushed to the hospital to be stitched up and given crutches for a badly sprained ankle. One other incident that stood out to her was on a domestic violence call nine years into her career, so this was like the late 90s. She said that it was unforgettable because it was a day that every officer hopes they never have to live. Well, let's call it what it is. The officers that are doing their jobs correctly and are who are good people, they never want to live through this day. <laughs> I'm not going to go on a rant about police brutality right now. So she gets this call. It's the middle of a shift change, so she has no backup, but needs to respond to this call immediately because it is a huge emergency. Kathy pulled up to the address she was sent to to find two men in an altercation on the front lawn, and it looked like one of the men was spurting blood as if an artery had been cut. The other man saw Kathy pull up and ran for it. She called dispatch for medical attention and then followed the suspect in her car, and eventually he ran down a side street, so she jumped out and pursued him on foot through a maze of back alleys until she finally caught him in a dead end. The suspect quickly pulled a knife, she drew her weapon, and began to back away. However, as she was backing away, the suspect lunged at her with the knife, she fired a shot, he lunged at her again, and she fired another shot. At that point, backup had finally arrived, they were able to take the man into custody, and Kathy was taken back to the station. They took her gun into evidence for a full investigation, which is part of the standard procedure when an officer does have to fire at a suspect. The suspect lived, and when he was interviewed at the hospital, he ended up giving a full confession. He said that he was a gang member who was out on parole after an armed robbery, and he admitted that he had spent the entire day drinking and watching movies. He then beat his girlfriend and their baby, and then fled the house when she called the cops. This was where he ran into an innocent bystander in the front yard and stabbed him. Luckily, that man also survived. After this incident, Kathy took some time off to recoup and to get some trauma counseling because this was a horrifying experience. When she got back to work, everyone was really happy to have her back saying, Xena the warrior princess has struck again. She understood that they were excited to see her, but she's like, what are you talking about? This was when they informed her that one of her shots had landed in the man's rib, but the other, even though she was not aiming for it, of course, went directly into his groin and they all thought that that was just typical. It's not like this was a great person, so I mean... We're not that worried about his balls being busted, right? Kathy was really glad that she made it home safe after that incident, but that day really changed things. She started thinking more about how being on the front lines was not exactly where she wanted to be. And her son and daughter were out of the house in college at that point, but her younger daughter was 15 years old. Because of this, Kathy started to consider careers in law enforcement that would get her out of the line of fire. In 1999, Kathy was 38, and she was thinking about the next moves for her career when she saw an ad stapled to the bulletin board at the police department. A company called DynCor was looking for people to get involved in their very first rent-a-cop program for International Police Task Force in Bosnia. The ad boasted a paycheck of $85,000 for a one-year contract, and this was twice as much as Kathy was making. To give some perspective on that amount, $85,000 in 1999 is equivalent to about $154,000 in 2023 money. The qualifications were listed as follows for this position. U.S. citizen, minimum of eight years full-time sworn-in civilian police service to include patrol training slash experience, must have been active within the last five years, military service may partially substitute for civilian police experience. Preference will be given to officers who are currently on duty. Ability to communicate in English, valid driver's license, and ability to drive a 4x4 vehicle, unblemished background record. Kathy knew that she was more than qualified for this position, and she was excited at the thought of doing something new and meaningful. She talked with her kids, who were fully on board, and they decided as a family that Kathy should go after this opportunity and take that one-year contract in Bosnia. And I did want to give a brief summary of what was going on in Bosnia at that time. The Bosnian War lasted from April of 1992 to December of 1995. It was the longest and bloodiest war on European soil since World War II. After the fall of communism in Yugoslavia and rise of power of the Serbian president, Bosnia and Herzegovina declared independence from Yugoslavia. And Bosnia and Herzegovina is one country. People generally shorten it just to Bosnia or to B&H. Bosnia takes up the north and central portion, and Herzegovina is the south and southwest portion. B&H is home to many different ethnicities and religions, including Catholic Croats, Orthodox Serbs, and Muslim Bosniaks who were working together peacefully to build their country. 
According to Britannica.com, quote, the multi-ethnic population and the country's historical and geographical position between Serbia and Croatia has long made Bosnia and Herzegovina vulnerable to national terrorist aspirations, end quote. So as much as they were trying to gain independence, it seems like they were being fought over constantly. In February and March of 1992, the European Union, the EU, wanted to split the country into smaller sections called cantons, which I learned are similar to states. The plans from the EU were rejected many times until April of 1992 when the EU and the US recognized Bosnia and Herzegovina as independent from Yugoslavia. This was a huge win for Bosnia, but their independence put them in a very dangerous position, like I mentioned before. In April of 1992, Bosnian Serb paramilitary forces and the Bosnian Serb units from the Yugoslav army attacked the Bosnian capital in Sarajevo. Within six weeks, about two-thirds of Bosnian territory was under Serb control. Most of the Bosniak population was removed from the area by what was referred to as quote-unquote ethnic cleansing. It was a nightmare. It was an unnecessary, devastating nightmare of a war. In May of 1992, the army units and equipment were placed under the command of a Bosnian Serb general, and concentration camps containing Muslims and Croats were set up in four regions where men, women, and children were starved, tortured, and killed. 10,000 innocent civilians, including 1,500 children, were killed by snipers. In the final year of the war, electricity and food supplies were completely cut off, and multiple peace proposals were being offered but denied by the Bosnian Serbs. During this time, locals dug what is now known as the Sarajevo Tunnel or the Tunnel of Hope. This tunnel stretched about a half mile long, and because they had very little tools or equipment available, this tunnel was dug by hand with shovels and picks. They kept it secret by starting it in the cellar of a house, and then they dug underneath the airport and up out onto the other side. Workers carried about 1,200 cubic meters of dirt and debris out of the tunnel with wheelbarrows. This tunnel was funded by the state, the army, and the city of Sarajevo. Workers would dig in eight-hour shifts, 24 hours a day, and they were paid with a pack of cigarettes per day, which was a high-demand item and very valuable for trading. Also, just a friendly reminder, this was happening in 1993. This was not long ago at all that this country was completely destroyed by a war. There were people digging tunnels and using cigarettes to barter for things. The reason I wanted to bring that up is because we need to learn. <laughs> we need to learn from the past and... Also, I don't know if there's anyone young enough watching this that would think that 1993 is a long time ago, but if you did say that, watch your mouth. So this tunnel was used for Bosnia and their allies to communicate in secret, to smuggle food, medical supplies, and ammunition underground, and this has been credited with saving the capital city. The tunnel is only about five feet high in most places, and they had a couple of major issues. First of all, the tunnel would flood, and the water could get up to as high as waist deep, and then they would have to go in and remove this water by hand with buckets and get it out of there. There was also no ventilation, so they had to wear masks as they moved through this difficult tunnel. It was a very difficult and dangerous job, but it made a huge difference for the people of Bosnia in their fight. There is now a memorial museum built on top of the tunnel entrance, and Vladimir Zubik, the deputy of the city council of Sarajevo, said it is there as, quote, a reminder for everyone so that a thing like this tunnel that provided the people of this city with minimum subsistence will never have to be used again. It will be a place where younger people will be able to study a part of our recent past, and it will be proof that this part of our history will never be forgotten, end quote. In February of 1994, NATO fighters shot down four Bosnian Serb aircraft in the first ever use of force by NATO. And if you are not familiar, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's made up of about 30 countries across Europe and North America and is meant to protect these allies' freedom and safety by political and military forces. These Bosnian Serb aircraft were shot down because they were violating the UN-imposed no-fly zone over the country, and in 1995, NATO launched another airstrike. That airstrike, combined with the large-scale Bosniak-Croat land defense, led to Bosnian Serb forces finally agreeing to a U.S.-sponsored peace talk in Dayton, Ohio. During this war, approximately 100,000 people were killed, including thousands of children, and nearly 2 million people were displaced, having lost their homes, their family, everything. Finally, the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed in December of 1995 and the war ended. However, the aftermath of this war was devastating. You don't just sign a peace treaty and then poof, everything's fixed. 
signing a peace agreement wasn't going to magically rebuild and rehome everyone in the country. So the International Police Task Force and the UN Civilian Affairs Office agreed to step in and provide help to rebuild, remove landmines, facilitate political elections, and rebuild the economy and the infrastructure. Huge job to take on that would need a ton of help and a ton of work. The UN sent officers from its national police forces from Italy, Germany, Spain, Canada, and so on. Since the U.S. doesn't have a national police force because we are split up by police forces in each state, the American officers sent for this were all private contractors. And this meant that was a very lucrative opportunity for American military contractors to make a big fat sum of money that had never been an option before. For the first three years, Brown and Root Services in Houston provided American police to Bosnia and seven other countries. But once their contract was up for new bids, DynCorp in Virginia underbid Brown and Root and won that contract, which, like I mentioned, brought Kathy into the situation. The reason I wanted to give you that rundown is because, first of all, it's a hugely important thing that happened not too long ago, and I basically knew nothing about it before I read about it in Kathy's book and then did a little investigoogling. What happened in Bosnia was horrendous, and we are seeing a lot of similar things happening with the war in Ukraine. I just don't understand why we can't, as human beings, ever learn. We never learn. We never learn from history. It's also important for you to understand the terror and trauma and tragedy that Bosnia went through before the UN and the International Police Task Force um, offered their help. Also, for the International Police Task Force, I will be using the IPTF acronym moving forward because it is a mouthful. Even saying IPTF is like bleh, throwing me off. So they put out a hand promising help and rebuilding and trainings and peace, and there ended up just being a bunch of horribly corrupt people at every level who got involved and went and just shit all over a country that had already been through hell. When Kathy told the police chief, Thomas Cassidy, that she would be resigning from her department to go work with the IPTF in Bosnia, he greatly advised her against it. He said that it was a bad idea and that she, quote, didn't want to go work with a bunch of idiots, end quote. He offered her a 30-day leave of absence, thinking that when it was over, Kathy would change her mind, but she knew she was never going to change her mind, and she did end up resigning. She didn't take him seriously when he warned her at first, but later, Kathy wondered if Chief Cassidy had heard more about the rumors than he had originally let on. To Kathy, this was an incredible opportunity to do something to make a difference, to fight for something she really believed in, next to like-minded people from all over the world who were ready to band together and help the people of Bosnia. However, she would quickly find out that that was not exactly the case. She said, quote, The truth was, most of my DynCorp colleagues had a personal story that compelled them to join the mission whether they admitted it or not. There had to be a pretty significant reason for someone at a later stage in his or her career to uproot without family and head 5,000 miles away. In one way or another, we were all running from something, but there was a difference between leaving and escaping. And some of my DynCorp colleagues were definitely escaping, taking cover in a place where no one knew the very bad things they had done back home and where they thought no one would ever notice if they carried on, this time taking advantage of a broken people and a broken system." End quote. It didn't take long for Kathy to start seeing some major issues with DynCorp. At first, there were things that were maybe more of like an orange flag, but those quickly turned more and more bright red as time went on. To apply for a position with DynCorp, Kathy filled out a very basic questionnaire and did a written psychological exam. They did not require her to do an in-person interview before offering her a position and inviting her along for the week-long training in Texas that was the last step before she'd be offered an actual contract. Kathy had been expecting rounds of interviews and background checks similar to what she went through to get hired on with the Lincoln PD, but she figured that her resume and her work experience had just been enough to get her through the first round and thought that they would probably do more extensive questioning at the training before actually extending an offer. But alas, it was actually because they didn't care for one second who they were hiring. Kathy arrived at the training in Texas, which was not at any kind of official DynCorp training facility. It was a rented space in part of an American Airlines building. She had been expecting to meet top officers from all over the U.S. with loads of training and backgrounds similar to her own, but she was surprised to see the mix of people who ended up showing up for the training. 
Some of them looked way too young to have that eight years of required experience they talked about. Some of them were older retirees, including one man who said he was 71 years old. A lot of the people were inexperienced officers from small towns with tiny one to two man police departments who had never seen a yearly pay over $20,000. So that $85,000 they were offering was like hitting a gold mine for some of these people. As they were waiting for the first day of training to start, some of the people there were excitedly chatting about the weaponry that they hoped to use on a peace mission, saying things like, quote, Do you think we'll get to train the locals on the big guns? How about explosives? I hope we can teach the locals a thing or two about the use of force, end quote. Yikes. Kathy did her best to keep her mouth shut, but thought to herself, quote, If you had a clue, you would have heard that there was a recent war, and the locals already knew a thing or two about guns, ammo, and sniper activity, end quote. I can't imagine having to sit there during this conversation and say nothing. As the conversation went on, she finally did interrupt and asked, quote, isn't anyone interested in the democratization of a country or in rebuilding community-based policing, end quote? No one replied. They just stared at her with blank looks on their faces as if they could not understand why she would be talking about, you know, caring about peace on a peace mission. For the time being, Kathy swallowed her concerns and reminded herself that this was just the first round recruits of training. Some of them wouldn't even be offered a contract. And surely once she actually got to Bosnia, she would be working with intelligent, highly trained professionals right? Not everyone was the worst. She did fall into a group of trainees who were on the same brainwave and became friends with people who were there to do the job of rebuilding and helping people. There were also plenty of people eliminated after the physical fitness testing, psych evaluations, and a few of them couldn't pass a drug test, so they were out. On the last night of the training, all of the new recruits had gathered together to get to know each other since they would likely be spending a lot of time together for the next year in their new contracted positions. Everyone is getting along, talking, chatting, sharing stories, until up walks a man named Jim from Mississippi. With his greasy hair and tobacco teeth, he burst into their group, bragging at the top of his lungs that he liked his first trip to Bosnia so much that he signed on for another year. And then he shocked everyone when he explained why. He said, quote, and I know where you can get really nice 12 to 15 year olds, end quote. In a stunned silence... Everyone slowly looked to Kathy, who was the only woman in the group, as if it were her job to try to figure out how to respond to this guy. She stared back at him, certain that she had misheard what he said. And Kathy thought, quote, Besides, DynCorp, now riding high on the coveted position as one of the largest government contractors, certainly would not have renewed the contract of a boasting pedophile, end quote. Well... The problem is that while DynCorp said applicants had to have a spotless record and eight years minimum experience, they were not upholding that at all. Kathy later found out that DynCorp was struggling to get as many positions filled as they needed to, so they started offering current employees $250 as referral bonuses. And they were waiving the eight-year requirement down to five years, and they completely removed the, quote, unblemished background record from the table. So DynCorp was ready to just throw any random idiot into a position and then offer them money to refer their idiot friends in order to fully staff this mission. After the training, they were handed their dark blue uniforms, finished with an American flag patch and light blue UN berets. Kathy was named the group leader, which was mostly just a glorified babysitter position. She would oversee the group's travel to Bosnia, which included so many issues. DynCorp had been given millions of dollars of government money to make this mission happen, but clearly that money was not being used properly at all. When mistakes with their travel popped up, they were all expected to use their own personal credit cards to pay for the issues and get new flights or what have you. And then hopefully they would be reimbursed, but that probably didn't happen all the time. So first up, DynCorp had chartered a Russian military aircraft to fly them to Bosnia. This flight was rejected by the FAA, so they had to book their own commercial flights, and the journey took forever. They got on a commercial flight to New York, then they were bused to another airport, they flew into London, then to Croatia, because DynCorp decided that it was the best option uh, for them to do it this way because it was cheaper for them to fly into Croatia. So from Croatia, they were then squished into two beat-up, bullet-ridden buses with no windows and no air conditioning and no storage for their luggage. So for 16 hours on this drive, they sat on top of their suitcases or held them on their laps as they bumped along the unpaved mountain journey for 16 hours. 
There were a couple of people who ditched as soon as they got to the UN base, saying that DynCorp had done nothing but lie to them again and again. I don't blame them one bit. Uh, Kathy was also starting to kind of panic at this point and considered leaving herself, but she just kept telling herself if she could get to her job in Bosnia, if she could just make it to the office, she could do what she set out to do. As they drove through the country, she saw firsthand the devastation caused by the war, and that alone reminded her why she was there. The first week in Bosnia, Kathy and the other new contractors went through a training in a nondescript UN building. It was surrounded by tall stone walls and barbed wire fences, armed guards were perched in lookout stations on the roof, and there were very specific walkways that they had to keep to because there were still landmines buried around the building. These landmines were hidden everywhere all over the country, in public gardens and public squares, it was a major problem. There were many, many people who died because of these hidden mines after the war, and others faced serious injuries and lost limbs because of them. Kathy settled into her training, and she met a lot of people who were very helpful and very well trained. Some of them didn't have quite the same fire as Kathy, and said that the best jobs to get were the desk jobs, because they were easy work, and that kept your weekends open for travel through Europe which was not something that Kathy was super worried about doing, but she said that when she first arrived, quote, To better understand the country and what people had been through, I paid a visit to the hauntingly sad Olympic Village in Sarajevo. Only several years before the siege, the city had been home to what Sports Illustrated called, quote, the sweetest winter Olympics of them all. Now, under the cheery Welcome to Sarajevo 84 sign depicting the cartoon Olympic mascot Vuko the Wolf touting into the village, I saw what happened when the Sarajevo cemeteries had overflowed. The Olympic soccer stadium had been turned into a mass gravesite with popsicle stick-shaped planks serving as headstones, lining the field from goal to goal. Most graves were unmarked, end quote. Between visiting that mass gravesite and seeing the destruction that was being caused for the people of Bosnia because of the landmines, she had a fire reignited. Kathy didn't go all the way to Bosnia to be a paper pusher, and she told her colleagues as much, saying that she wanted to work with the locals on building democracy and effective policing solutions. One of her colleagues said to her, quote, the less you become involved in trying to solve major issues, the happier you will be, end quote. Then what are we doing here? I don't understand that attitude. So that didn't slow Kathy down at all, and she applied for a position in the Human Rights Division. She was required to give a presentation to two stupid men who would evaluate her. She gave her presentation on her work on sexual assault investigations and her methods of collecting evidence. As her presentation went on and she got more into the details, the two men observing the presentation got more and more uncomfortable and turned bright red when she used the word vaginal. Who are these people? Grow the hell up. You're adults. So, <laughs> I just, uh. They gave her an A++ on her presentation, and she was offered a position as a human rights investigator, which is exactly what she wanted. The new DynCorp hires went through a recruitment process where the leaders from each IPTF station could decide who they wanted on their teams. Kathy said that this felt like a fraternity or sorority rush where each of the leaders, who were mostly men, would hungrily sniff around the new recruits looking to recruit the few women that were sent in. One of the men told her that he would love to have her at his station because they threw the best parties in the mission. <laughs> Again, she was like, cool dude, still not what I'm here for. Kathy and four other Americans were recruited to the Elijah station with Mr. Party Bro himself. There was a military base in Bosnia where the official military people lived. NATO guidelines did not allow their soldiers to go off base unless specifically assigned, but this was DynCorp, so they could just do whatever they wanted. The DynCorp contractors could just roam the country as they pleased in the UN-provided Land Rovers that they could fill with gas as much as they needed and eat anywhere and stay out all night and meet locals. This also meant that they had to find their own living accommodations since they didn't live on the base and there was no official housing for the DynCorp people. They didn't have a hard time finding affordable housing options because rent was only about $200 to $400 per month and food was very inexpensive. Most of the people in Bosnia were making around $10 a day, so families would rent their homes to mission personnel and that money was a huge benefit for these families that they rented from. Kathy and a few people that she became friends with rented a farmhouse together, and they all got along really well. Kathy also met a man named Jan, who was from the Netherlands. They clicked immediately, and Kathy said, quote, Our eyes locked until we realized others were taking notice. Embarrassed, I stammered, Oh, yes, pleasure to meet you as well, and quickly moved on. Jan's confident smile trailed me, end quote. When she met Jan, he was about six weeks away from finishing up his time in Bosnia, and Kathy said that 
at the time, she didn't want to have some pointless fling and she didn't want to get involved trying to figure out a long distance relationship. So, of course, they fell madly in love and Jan was a huge support through all the difficulties that Kathy would eventually come up against. For Kathy's position, she reported to the IPTF commander, who was a French general named Vincent Corduroy. And above him was the highest ranking official, the UN special representative to the secretary general. And then that guy reported to the secretary general. People moved through these ranks very quickly since there was so much turnover and people were only in one to two year contracts. Americans made up almost half of the mission, so most of these highest ranks were held by Americans. Kathy's job description was given to her in a training pamphlet that was very wordy and very confusing to understand, but essentially, she was a civilian police monitor working with the IPTF, but contracted by DynCorp. DynCorp didn't actually have anything to do with the IPTF. They were more in charge of finding contractors and handling the back-end corporate stuff like payroll, timesheets, supplying uniforms, Many of the regional commanders and key leaders in the Internal Affairs Office and the Organized Crime Unit were DynCorp contractors, and since everyone was really taking advantage of that referral fee program, a lot of them already knew each other, and it was basically just a big American boys club frat party all the time for some of them. Spoiler alert, a good amount of these people absolutely sucked. But, thankfully, there were a lot of people who really were fabulous at their jobs and had their heads on straight and were there for the right reasons. On the other side, Kathy also had to report to the U.S. Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, who was a British attorney named Madeline Reese. Madeline Reese is also a key player and a very important part of Kathy's story. The specific job that Kathy took on, working with the Human Rights Office and the Organized Crime Unit, didn't appeal to a lot of Americans who had said before that they were looking for those comfy desk jobs that didn't take a lot of work. But when Kathy did take that job that was a hard job, she worked with a lot of other really great people from different countries. Madeline Reese was very experienced and great at her job. She didn't let anyone push her around and she worked her ass off. And from what I understand, the US military was not super stoked about the DynCorp contractors. Like I mentioned, the DynCorp contractors were not allowed to live on the base, but they could shop at the PX for American brand groceries and use their gym, but that was pretty much it. And this was because a lot of the DynCorp contractors had made total asses of themselves on base by shoplifting from the PX or sneaking into restricted areas and other various obnoxious behaviors, so the military didn't want to associate themselves with the DynCorp Americans who were making Americans look bad in general, and I don't blame them one bit. As Kathy settled into her position, she started to realize that there were a lot of struggles to get everything going. There were so many different departments all trying to work together, and there were basically just a lot of cooks in the kitchen that all needed to be happy and on the same page. And then you, of course, had language barriers. There was also a constant employee turnover from those contracts ending, and then there were officers from less developed countries who didn't know how to collect evidence, interview suspects in a case, or create any kind of a case file. It took a lot of time and effort from everyone to train the other IPTF members, as well as the Bosnian local police. On the flip side, Americans and Europeans also had to kind of swallow their own pride and rethink their own ideas on the quote-unquote right way to do police work. Computers and other tech simply weren't available. For example, rape kits. Even if they trained people how to properly take a sample and store it, the police stations didn't even have a fridge where they would be able to store those samples, let alone a crime lab to analyze them. Kathy shared an office with Bo Andreasen, who was a Swedish crime inspector with a lot of experience in human rights investigations. Bo and Kathy worked really well together, and they got along great. One day, their supervisor, Harry, he's the guy who was all, my unit is totally party central, dudes. So party boy Harry <laughs> called Kathy and Bo into his office and said that his language assistant had witnessed two men that she recognized as alleged local mafia assault a local police officer. Two other local police officers showed up and took the two mafia men into custody. Harry refused to give them an official statement because he said that he didn't want to put his language assistant in danger of retaliation for telling him this, but he told them, but he told them that the alleged criminals were released without proper authorization. It seems like Harry wanted to completely stay out of it, so Bo and Kathy offered to go to the local police station and see what happened. As they began looking into this incident, it became more and more clear that the local special support unit was taking things into their own hands, which was a huge issue because the Bosnian police and the IPTF were supposed to be working together. That was like the whole point. 
the Bosnian police had tried to cover up a secret raid that was performed by the special support unit. Bo and Kathy interviewed the men who had been arrested, and they told them that the Sarajevo Ministry of the Interior was corrupt and that they had information they were willing to share. Kathy and Bo gave them the number to the IPTF station so that they could give that info to the correct people about the corruption because the IPTF station would definitely want to know about that. A week after one of the men made his allegations of corruption, he was attacked by Bosnian officers who burst into the restaurant he owned wearing bulletproof vests and ski masks and beat him and then threatened his entire family. He believed that this was retaliation for comments that he made about the minister being involved in smuggling cigarettes, and he said that he knew the minister was involved because he was also smuggling cigarettes, so he definitely knew who was involved. Several other people who were also attacked at the restaurant then turned to the IPTF to uh, report the local police for brutality. Apparently, corruption and smuggling within the government wasn't really a secret, and the local police wanted to protect themselves and just let it happen, which was part of why the UN was sent in. The police unit that performed this unauthorized raid on the restaurant was headed by the Sarajevo Minister of the Interior. Uh, like I told you, there was corruption at every level. As Kathy and Bo were putting all of this together with the IPTF advisor, they were informed that the chief of the Hadziki station had called the IPTF and said that Kathy and Bo were no longer welcome at that station at all. Which is weird, because it's literally their job to go in and fix these issues happening within the local police based on mandates set out in the Dayton Agreement. But apparently the people above Kathy and Bo decided that they didn't care about that part of the mission. There was a man named Roy, who was a DynCorp officer that had been bragging on and on about his relationship with the minister at one of Harry's parties, so they decided to set up a meeting with him about this incident with that station. Much to their surprise, Roy said that he already knew about the unauthorized raid and said that it wasn't a big deal. Even when they explained that this raid had direct connections to the Sarajevo Ministry of the Interior, Roy brushed them off as if it were none of the IPTF's business. Our party boy Harry eventually started acting weird about their investigation, even though it was his tip that pushed them to start it. Out of nowhere, he changed Bo's schedule, which completely messed with everything that he and Kathy had been working on. When Bo pushed back on this change and tried to point out the issues with it, Harry yelled at him to get the hell out of his office, and then in front of the entire staff, suggested that Kathy and Bo were getting too involved in the case and said that their impartiality was in question. Kathy asked him, quote, aren't we here to investigate international corruption? To which Harry replied, quote, I think you need to back off a bit, end quote. And then he warned, or threatened, that, quote unquote, accidents happen here all the time and they should be careful. Sounds like a threat to me. Kathy and Bo continued hitting roadblocks as they tried to investigate the situation further, and it became glaringly obvious that the DynCorp people in positions of power were banning together to get this investigation completely thrown out. Harry told them that he expected them to hand over their entire case file with all of the interviews and evidence that they had gathered. This was not part of protocol. He had no right to take that information. So they got in touch with the UN Chief of Human Rights, who agreed that it was completely inappropriate for Harry to ask them for that file. And honestly, that probably put more of a spotlight on their suspicions of Harry. The chief asked them to hand deliver that file to the UN main headquarters immediately, which they did. Then Harry came and asked them again for the file, and they informed him that they didn't have it because they gave it to Maine HQ, and he was furious. Everyone in that conversation knew that Maine headquarters far outranked Harry and even the regional commander, but Harry didn't believe that they no longer had the file, so he acted like a little bitty baby, and out of nowhere, Kathy was demoted from her position. She was given no warning, and I'm pretty sure no real reason for the change, but he kicked her out of her office. While her pay would remain the same, she would now be sitting at a desk, kept away from investigations, and all of the work she had been doing with training the local police. Kathy would be transferred to the front lines in Visegrad to work the night shift. This change of sending Kathy to Visegrad was not only a professional demotion, but a very dangerous move. This area was a Serb-populated area that was very loudly anti-American. There had been countless violent attacks against Americans to the point where all of the U.S. monitors were pulled from that area, and Kathy would be the first American sent back into the area. 
There was also no human rights office in Visegrad, so Kathy would be completely pulled out of her area of expertise and the work that she had been doing would be completely taken away from her. Bo could already see where this was going, so he quickly applied for a job at the regional human rights office so that he could get out from under the insanity and keep his investigation going in this case. Once Bo transferred, he made a plea on Kathy's behalf. Bo is also a badass, like Kathy, we love to see it. So Kathy was surprised and probably thrilled when she got a call from Madeline Reese at the head of the UN Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. I mentioned Madeline earlier. She is one of Kathy's supervisors, but not her direct boss. I told you there are so many divisions and offices to keep track of in this situation. Anyways, Madeline was incredible at what she did. And about Madeline, Kathy said, quote, She was a British attorney with considerable experience in both discrimination law and women's rights non-governmental organizations. She was fast thinking, fast talking, no-nonce woman who was passionate about her human rights work and unconcerned about whom she befriended or whom she offended, end quote. Kathy ended up meeting with Madeline and another woman named Maureen Kelly, who was also an American DynCorp contractor. Kathy was a bit nervous to talk about the situation with another DynCorp contractor there, since it seemed like they were all going to form a little gang to protect each other, but Maureen had also experienced firsthand the same good old boys frat club attitudes and unwanted sexual advances that Kathy had, so she was ready to join the ranks. Madeline told Kathy that it seemed like someone didn't want her poking around, digging into things, and that made her the perfect candidate for a new project they were working on. This project was between the IPTF and the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. Basically, Harry tried to kick her out and shut her down, and that ended up getting her a fabulous new position, plus the opportunity to rub it in their faces just a little bit, which I love for her. Kathy would be transferring to the Zeneca station and heading a UN project called Effectively Addressing Violence Against Women. To make this transfer, she had to have Harry and their regional commander sign some paperwork. And the signature is just a formality at that point. They didn't actually have any say because the main headquarters far outranked those assholes. On her last day in her position, Kathy walked confidently into the regional commander's office, who snidely said to her, quote, I don't know who you are or what you're trying to prove. Enjoy your time in Visegrad, end quote. Kathy politely and calmly informed him that she was in fact in his office because she needed his signature, quote, I am sorry you don't like my work. It seems the people at Maine headquarters see it differently, end quote. Hi, can we make this story into a TV series because Kathy is an icon. To finish up Bo's part of this investigation, he worked on the case for 18 months, and it brought down the Minister of the Interior and 29 local police officers, including the minister's nephew, who was in charge of that raid, on charges of assault and abuse of authority. Such a win. The Zeneca station was 40 miles north of Sarajevo, so Kathy moved into a new apartment. She said that this apartment was right by a train track and would shake all night long as trains and tanks thundered by, but she made the most of it. The IPTF station she would be working in was set up in an old steel mill that didn't even have a toilet for them to use. The 25 staff members had to make the most of a sewer hole in the floor that used to have a toilet over it, but it was somehow taken in a raid or something like that. Obviously, the office wasn't the best of working conditions, but the group at the station, the officers and the language assistants were all great. They all got along really well and would spend their holidays together and go out to eat at local restaurants and work hard at their jobs. Kathy's new position was to help implement the pilot project working with local NGOs, judiciary ministers, judges, the UN, and local police to get everyone on the same page. Huge task. This was where they had their first major case that changed big things in Bosnia. And just a heads up, I am going to be talking about a domestic violence case. As always, I won't give any graphic details, but as we move forward into the rest of this story, we are getting into the upsetting and tragic hard to talk about parts, so I just wanted to give you that heads up as we get going. This case involved a Muslim woman named Azra who had been stabbed by her husband. When Kathy and her language assistant interviewed Azra, she said, quote, My husband stabbed my leg. I tried to escape from him, and the knife went through my hand. I have told police again and again of my husband beating me, but always they send me back home. There is not much hope now. I will likely die at his hand, end quote. I wish that I could say that the world has changed at all since then, but we all know that while moves have been made, this is still a major issue in many parts of the world. In America, this situation would have been classified as a domestic assault with a deadly weapon, and hopefully the husband would have gone to jail. Again, we all know that that is unfortunately not the case even in America, but in Bosnia, it was 
a million times worse. Laws regarding assault obviously existed, but they didn't apply at all to domestic disputes because a wife was seen as her husband's property and spousal abuse was not taken seriously at all. It was no concern. Women had absolutely no power to defend themselves legally, and to Kathy and her team, it felt so obvious that this case should be treated as a felony assault because there were multiple hospital records and police reports leading up to this event, but to the local police that Kathy was working with, that was a shocking and groundbreaking idea. They were able to move Azra to Medica Zeneca, which is an NGO shelter that offered support and counseling for abused women. Thankfully, they were starting to put these things into play and she had somewhere to go. As they put together a case, Kathy's team of local officers was hesitant at first. This was completely new territory for them. But they quickly got on board and enthusiastically learned to go through police procedure and wanted to fight to get Azra's husband convicted. If they could pull this off, it would be the first ever case of domestic violence tried in Bosnia. And again, this was 1999. First ever domestic abuse case tried in Bosnia. They did receive some pushback from higher authorities, but there was one judge in particular who was ready and very interested in their human rights work and supported this case. Azra's case went to court in early spring of 2000, where the case was tried and the husband was found guilty. The husband was only punished with a fine, but it was a huge win and something that had never been done before. This was major progress being made in a big step forward in the human rights work that they were doing. Kathy said, quote, The local police now had the tools and protocol to investigate crimes and pursue charges. Officers had gone from making determinations based on hearsay, favoritism, and bribes to having respect and appreciation for enforcing law and serving justice, end quote. Azra's huge amount of bravery and willingness to work with Kathy's team empowered other women to show up to IPTF stations and fight for their own justice. In early 2000, a woman was brought to the Zeneca station after being picked up by local police. They thought this woman was possibly a sex worker, and she was found with her hair matted with dirt and leaves wandering near the Bosna River wearing a short, shiny skirt and a sequin top, which was something typically worn by sex workers in this area. At first, this woman didn't want to open up to Kathy and her language assistant, but eventually she told Kathy that her name was Victoria, and she didn't speak any of the local languages, and when they realized that she wasn't from Bosnia, they were really surprised. People simply weren't moving to Bosnia because there were no jobs and very little housing options. Obviously, there was a language barrier there, so as they waited for a translator that could speak Victoria's language, Kathy did what she could with the three words that she did understand. Victoria, Moldova, and Florida. At first, Kathy was confused by the Florida part, but then she realized there's a bar in town called The Florida. It was right next to a local restaurant where Kathy and some of the other officers would frequently go. They had noticed plenty of UN trucks parked in the front of Florida, but just assumed that it was overflow parking from the small restaurant parking lot. Sex work was not a secret there. Many women had lost their husbands, fathers, brothers, and found themselves completely out of options, so they turned to sex work with no other way to survive in a war-torn country. While they waited for a translator, Kathy called the local police to check out the club, but the detective who was supposed to be on duty that day hadn't shown up for his shift because he had been badly beaten the night before, at the Florida bar. Kathy, being a badass as usual, jumped quickly into action. Alarm bells were going off in Kathy's head and she was worried about Victoria and she needed to keep her safe until they could figure out what exactly was going on here. They weren't able to send her to the women's shelter because it was specifically for domestic violence cases. So she called the higher ups and asked if they could get a hotel room and send an officer to guard Victoria's room while they figured things out. But she was told that there was no funding to make that happen. So Kathy took off her beret threw a few dollars in, and told everyone to pass it around and make it happen. She said, quote, I would file the hotel expense, but we all knew we were not likely to see a reimbursement. Even though the Human Rights Office procedure encouraged us to arrange accommodations for victims and bill the expense, it was a ridiculous expectation that a country unable to pay its cops on time would come up with funds for a foreign woman in distress, end quote. Kathy, along with her language assistant and a local police officer who worked in their office, Goran, headed to the Florida bar. The crumbling white stucco building looked empty, but the open sign was on, so Kathy headed inside to do a basic security check. There was no one around. Half full glasses of beer sat on the bar. There was a smoky, sweaty odor hanging in the air. There were tables and chairs overturned near a stage with a stripper pole and a red drape. She said, quote, Nightclubs with nothing to hide do not clear out this hastily, and it was apparent that someone alerted them to our arrival, end quote. As she walked around to the back of the bar, she saw a metal gun box, and when she opened it, she was surprised that there was no gun inside. 
Instead, she found a fat stack of U.S. dollar bills, which was a huge red flag. The only people using American money were the U.N. workers who could get the money on base, and they had seen the U.N. vehicles outside the Florida bar many times, so dots were connecting. As she picked up the stack of money, even more surprisingly, there was a bundle of a dozen or so passports, each from a young woman from different countries. A 16-year-old from Ukraine, a 20-year-old from Moldova, a 15-year-old from Romania, and so on. She remembered back on her training in Texas when Greasy Jim from Mississippi told the group unprompted about the access he'd had to young girls in Bosnia. She then found Victoria's passport in the bunch, and a terrifying picture was starting to take shape. Outside on the side of the building was a rickety old set of wooden stairs that led to a door. Garan tried the door, it was locked, he called out, he knocked, and he looked to Kathy for their next move. Kathy said that some of the local police were very hesitant to get involved in certain situations and would say things like, quote, for everything good, there will be double the bad, end quote. At first, Kathy could not understand this attitude, and she mistook it for apathy. As she got to know the people better, she figured out that the truth was they were a country that had faced tragedy after tragedy. It's not that they were indifferent to the problems. They had seen such terror and were afraid of what else they would find behind closed doors, and that made them really hesitant to go sniffing around, if that makes sense. The door was weathered and worn, completely falling apart, so Kathy did what she called her best magnum PI move and kicked down the crappy old door. Inside, there were seven wide-eyed, terrified women that were huddled together, staring up at them. They were wearing sweats and t-shirts that were either too big or too small, and makeup from the previous night smeared their faces. The only furniture in the room was two stained mattresses on the floor and a trash can with a used condom hanging out of it. There were plastic grocery bags full of miniskirts and shiny tank tops, similar to what Victoria had been wearing, and this was what was considered their quote-unquote uniforms. Kathy did her best to comfort and reassure the girls that they were there to help, but the girls stayed huddled together, terrified, unsure of what to do. Near one of the girls, Kathy saw a notebook and asked if she could look at it, and the girl nodded. The notebook was a carefully detailed ledger that showed the girl's services and pricing ranging from 25 to 100 Dutch marks. Another column with a balance showing 7,000 DM, which is over 3,000 American dollars. And the third column was all of her work precisely recorded and added up to an amount that barely made a dent in that $7,000 that she quote-unquote owed to these people. Kathy told them that they were there to help. They wanted to get there somewhere safe. She asked if there were any more girls hidden, but no one answered because they were scared out of their minds. Finally, one girl pointed out the window toward the stream that led down to the Bosna River and told them, quote, we don't want to end up floating, end quote. It was at this point that I had to literally put this book down and, like, step away for a while. Um... It just, it makes my heart ache thinking about these young women scared to death in a country that they are completely unfamiliar with in a position that they never dreamed they would be. What was happening here was obviously not voluntary sex work. It was human trafficking. Kathy radioed for backup and cars to transport the girls to the IPTF station. They had to handle the police protocol to a T so that they could get this case going on the right foot. Victoria said that she had been attacked by her captor at the Florida, and he had threatened to kill a local detective. Victoria described the detective and said that he often came to the Florida bar to drink, and the owner would sneak money to the detective in exchange for tip-offs when police were planning a raid. Apparently, the other part of this arrangement was that this detective, quote, took liberties with Victoria and the other girls for free, end quote. The night before, the detective showed up to the Florida, and the owner wasn't there. He was drinking and getting belligerent, and when the owner showed up, he was pissed, and he held a gun to the detective's head and attempted to throw him out, and then he took his rage out on Victoria. Remember earlier when I mentioned that the detective that was supposed to be on duty that day didn't show up to work because he had allegedly been beaten at the Florida? So after the owner attacked Victoria. He walked down to the cellar, and Victoria took this moment to run out of the bar, and that was when the police found her wandering around. The detective she named was one of the men who gave Kathy pushback originally when she was working on Osra's domestic violence case. The other girls were very hesitant to talk at first. They gave very vague descriptions of local IPTF officers, local police, and military men who had visited the bar. They were absolutely scared and threatened into submission. If they testified against the bar owners, their lives would be in danger. As I said before, the U.S. dollars that they found were a big deal. DynCorp members would cash their checks on base, 
but everyone else was paid in DM and the Bosnian currency. Kathy said, quote, The use of overseas brothels by soldiers, sailors, travelers, for the sake of argument, let's just say men, is not new or surprising, end quote. But this situation was different. If men were paying for sex with trafficking victims who were underage and kept against their will, this was not illegal visits to a sex worker. This was rape. Their next step was to get the girls into safe houses so that the International Organization of Migration could help them get back to their countries. Eventually, the owner of the Florida bar was arrested, not for sex trafficking, but for employing illegals without work permits, which is better than nothing, I guess. The detective involved was decertified as a police officer and admitted that he'd been taking the money in exchange for warning the bar owner when there would be raids. He claimed that he had taken the money out of desperation because his wife had a disease of her organs and needed expensive medication. And the raping of the trafficked victims helped your wife's situation how, you asshole. All right, moving on. After this first incident, everything looked different to Kathy. Areas that she patrolled and used to be comfortable with seemed strange now, and she felt suspicious every time she saw bars with obviously American names, such as Crazy Horse, Atlanta, Hooters, and more than one Florida. As word began to spread about what happened at the Florida, dozens of women and girls came forward to the IPTF offices. The influx of human trafficking was not a coincidence. Bosnia fit the typical scenario. A quote from Kathy about the situation said, Human trafficking follows a predictable path of infestation. It seeks out environments that are warm with tumult, such as the aftermath of war or the fall of communism. Then it preys on desperate victims who are brought in over porous borders and past bribable guards. Strategically, it breeds near a region teeming with internationals because they are the ones who have the money to feed it, end quote. Brothels masquerading as cafes, clubs, and hotels popped up around the military bases where there were not just soldiers, but hundreds of DynCorp employees who were working as mechanics food service staff, consultants, maintenance staff, engineers, etc. The DynCorp employees were not confined to the bases like the military personnel. They could just do whatever they pleased. And areas that started off as a place for people to buy and trade supplies and food quickly turned into girls and women being herded in, forced to strip and sold to the highest bidder. In April of 2000, Kathy was almost done with her year-long contract, but she was given the option to extend another six months and take over as the gender officer at the UN main headquarters, where she would coordinate trainings, perform investigations in human rights cases such as sexual assault, gender issues, domestic violence, and human trafficking. This was a really good opportunity, but Kathy was almost 40, and she said that in the police force, getting hired on somewhere new over 40 was very difficult. She had been looking forward to settling down, somewhere nice like Colorado Springs, where she could spend a lot of time outdoors and put down some actual roots. But this new position was a really good opportunity, and of course, she had Jan, who had moved back to the Netherlands, to think about. They would see each other about once a month and kept in touch as much as possible, and when Kathy tried to explain to Jan that if she was going to continue a law enforcement career, she needed to make things happen for herself now or never and get back to the U.S. and find a position. Jan said that he voted never and said that she should think more about the option of an international career since she'd been so good at what she did for the UN, which was a very good point. But also, I just, I love their love. It's like such a bright spot in this horrible story that I just really appreciate. So Kathy decided that it did make sense for her to extend and take the opportunity at the main UN headquarters. UNHQ was in a brand new building, much nicer and completely different than the old office with the hole in the floor style toilet. Main HQ was similar to a small military base. They had a gym, a medic, and a cafeteria with a couple of cafes. The 20-story building was surrounded by a chain-link fence with UN flags flying high. Kathy would be part of the Gender Desk, which had four IPTF investigators and several human rights attorneys from different countries such as Germany, India, England, Canada, Greece, Austria, and Senegal, who had different areas of expertise in housing issues, prison conditions, custody issues, government corruption, assassinations, and gender slash sexual offenses, and human trafficking. Also in the building, unfortunately, were some of the DynCorp employees who were a stark contrast to the other internationals, such as their rude behavior, their general disrespect to other people and their surroundings, and their just overall sloppiness. They didn't take any pride in what they were doing or what they were trying to do. A lot of these sloppy DynCorp people would cause a lot of trouble for Kathy and her hardworking colleagues. 
About 40% of the caseload of the Human Rights Office was working trafficking cases and working to create a packet called Operating Procedures for Trafficking Victims that would be sent to the police stations and IPTF stations with a list of interview questions to ask trafficking victims. Those questions included, quote, How did you leave your country? From where and through which border points? By which means of transportation? Were you sold for money? Were you involved in any sexual acts with paying customers or other persons? If yes, were you forced to do so? And lastly, who used your services, local police slash military, politicians, international community, end quote. This packet also included a document to sign if the woman wanted to be repatriated to her home country. That packet would be put together by the local police and the IPTF and then go to Kathy for record keeping and follow up. This provided a standard procedure for processing and assessing victims that had never been done before in Bosnia. It was difficult to get this system down. The process took a few weeks where they would attempt to put victims in a safe house while the documents were prepared. While they waited for the documents, the Human Rights Office would look at the possibility of having the victims testify against their captors in court. This was a very difficult and traumatic thing for them to do, and none of the survivors volunteered at first. Kathy said, quote, No matter how much evidence existed, a broken, ineffective system did not adequately provide a safe environment or the follow-up care for a victim to feel secure enough to testify, end quote. So from the safe house, the victims would then be, quote-unquote, repatriated, but really it was kind of just to get them out of there so that they were no longer Bosnia's problem. They were sent off with no money to the country of their choosing that would give them a passport. Some of the girls did go home, uh, but some of them did not want to go home. Whether it was because they felt too ashamed and because of some cultures, they would be treated as outcasts, or even worse, sometimes their own families had sold them into slavery in the first place. Kathy said, quote, at least a third of the time, the girls did not make it out of the airport in the destination country before they were abducted again, end quote. This was something that happened because the local mafia would be alerted to her arrival and there would be someone waiting to pick her up there. Sometimes it was even the local police who were bribed would take her right back to traffickers. Kathy said, quote, very little was efficient in this part of the world except for the well-greased machine of human trafficking, end quote. One day, a bigger case came to Kathy's attention. A diplomatic vehicle with a recorded license plate number was spotted at the Moulin Rouge Club. The person driving was described as an Asian American male who went into the Moulin Rouge Club and requested several females for sexual services. It was not at all difficult for them to determine who this was because of the description and the specific diplomatic license plate. This person absolutely worked for the UN. Kathy followed procedure and sent it to SRSG Jacques Paul Klein. Klein had a decorated Air Force career and had specifically been selected by the UN Secretary General to serve as the special representative of the Secretary General. He was basically their department's big boss. Kathy had actually had an interaction with Klein before this um, at the airport on her way back to Bosnia from the Netherlands. He was loud and obnoxious and bossy, and he yelled at all of the airport attendants and made a huge scene about their flights being canceled. To me personally, he sounded very intense and dramatic and super entitled because of his position. A month after Kathy sent the file about this UN worker to Klein, it was sent back with his initials on a post-it note that said, quote, this was dealt with a month ago, with an exclamation point. She was very confused about this, so she spoke to Kaoru Okazumi, who was a talented worker that was a few years out of NYU law school and specialized in human rights laws. She had spent the previous years working with local judges and lawyers in the new court system. She was great at her job and willing to listen to Kathy. She quietly told Kathy that the initials were definitely SRSG Kleins, and everyone knew who the suspect was, but it was all being brushed under the rug. Kauru suggested that they should start their own set of files for things like that. Of course, send the documents to the correct places, but keep photocopies of everything just in case, because stuff like this was happening all the time. In July of 2000, a man named David Lamb, who was one of Kathy's American colleagues working in Tuzla, came to ask Kathy what was going on with a case report that a local officer had put their life on the line to prepare. Kathy told David that this was the first time she was ever seeing or hearing anything about this report, and as David prepared to give her the full rundown and she again said, it didn't sound familiar, he told her, quote, you will see why. This case file implicated an American in forging documents and buying a trafficked woman from a Tuzla nightclub called the Istanbul. In this file, there were specific names, photos, and even videotapes of SFOR and IPTF officers 
frequenting the nightclubs, paying for services with trafficked women. David told her that this had gone uninvestigated for a year, so it was sent to the gender desk before Kathy got there, so someone else had it before her. It should have gone to the IPTF internal affairs, and then to the IPTF commissioner, and then up to SRSG Klein. Two of the staff members that were part of the IPTF internal affairs, which would have been the next step above Kathy, were Americans with DynCorp. And above the internal affairs was the deputy commissioner, J. Michael Steers, who was an American and the highest ranking DynCorp monitor in Bosnia. So he worked for the UN, but he was still a private contractor with DynCorp, so he was paid extra for this elevated position. The incident David was looking into should have been a confidential UN matter, but it was very possible that it had been told to DynCorp since Steers was working for both the UN and answering to DynCorp and had a bunch of buddies working in there. Steers was a retired deputy from Aurora, Colorado, which was the same police department as the site manager, Pascal Budge, who assisted with the recruitment of monitors into the mission. Isn't that just so convenient? And just hire all your friends. Pascal Budge was not on a one-year contract. He was actually a full-time DynCorp employee. And as long as DynCorp kept those government contracts going, he continued to get a paycheck. So we can assume that it's in Budge's own interest to keep DynCorp looking good so that he can keep his job. But on top of that, DynCorp would receive a big fat bonus from the U.S. government every time there was a mission time with quote-unquote no incidents. I can't believe that's a thing because this gives a very clear incentive for Budge, the site manager, to encourage Steers, the deputy commissioner, to deal with misbehaving Americans quietly and under the radar so that they can continue getting those bonuses for zero incident years. Everyone sucks and I hate it. This is where it gets even more awful and also confusing. DynCorp monitors were American cops, but as IPTF employees, they were basically immune from the law. They weren't held to U.S. law because they weren't in the U.S. They weren't under military regulations and they weren't under Bosnian law. This makes absolutely no sense to me. I guess they're just supposed to assume that the people being hired into these positions are good law-abiding people. I cannot figure out how they can just be immune to the law across the board. Like if you work in those positions, it's just the purge and you just get to do whatever you want. I don't get it. For people who were doing the right thing, knowing that apparently no one was being held to any standard of law, it was hard to know who they could actually trust and who was being shady. Kathy and David weren't sure who to turn to because the people above them that they should be giving that information to were clearly in on all of the deception. So they were kind of stuck with the incident with the officers being accused of participating in human trafficking. Kathy described it that it felt like a reality show full of narcissists where producers sit in a back room and just wait for the drama to explode. She said, quote, the IPTF episode was packed with all the essential elements, lots of money, lots of free time to scheme, completely new surroundings, a continent away from home, an audience of broken, desperate people ripe to be taken advantage of, corruption plots dangling like carrots, and the kicker, anything goes, there are no laws, end quote. So Kathy decided to send this report to Internal Affairs, even though it would probably just get thrown in the garbage and not sent to the correct people. And then she gave a copy of the report to her good friend Thor in the Joint Task Force because Thor could just surpass Steers completely and give it directly to the IPTF commissioner, Vincent Corduroy, who I mentioned before. He's a French general who I think seems to be on the right path and on the right side of things. Even then, though, no investigation ever took place and the people who were accused finished their contracted time, collected their pay, and went home to act completely normal after being the worst. No one would ever be able to prove what they did or didn't do. Nothing was documented with their names on it. And they could just go back to real life and get normal jobs. And no amount of digging or background checks by future employers would ever flag them as someone who was participating in arguably some of the worst felonious activities you can get yourself into. I don't want the awful parts of this whole situation to take away from the fact that a lot of progress was being made in Bosnia. There were just as many people doing incredible work, both in the UN, the IPTF, the Bosnian police, everyone across the board who wanted to make a difference. But there were such major issues in the processes because it seemed like there were a lot of people who were making mistakes. And whether it was a genuine lack of knowledge or purposeful ignorance.
For example, sometimes trafficking victims would be arrested during raids by local police and IPTF monitors without the proper training. There were women who needed help, who came looking for help sometimes, who were found at brothels and then charged for prostitution, not having adequate work licenses, and being in the country without proper ID. Like, yeah, that's what they're trying to tell you. They don't want to be doing any of those things. I just, it must have been so horrifying and infuriating for these women not knowing who to trust. On top of not knowing who to trust in law enforcement, they were terrified to come forward to Kathy, fearing their captors. Everyone was aware that young women in tight, sequin clothing, appearing to be European, were often found floating in the River Bosna. Kathy and many others in the UN and IPTF positions, let's just call it what it is, it was mostly women in those positions that were doing their best to help the trafficking victims. I'm not going to say it was only women. There were plenty of men who were doing a great job, but the people spearheading it and actually getting shit done were women. I'm just saying, let's have a ton of women be put into powerful positions and just see how it goes. Because I think we could get some serious stuff done. The first woman to testify against her captors was a 17-year-old girl named Oana, who was born in Albania, and her parents were currently living in Kosovo. Because of the political turmoil happening in Kosovo, they would not recognize her as eligible for patriotism without an ID or passport that she didn't have, which also meant that she couldn't go back to Albania, so she became a girl with no country. This happened all the time. They had nowhere to send her, so she essentially became a ward of the UN. Awana was addicted to heroin because that is how her captor controlled his victims. He had a bunch of the local police on his payroll and always avoided raids at the bars, so he just kept getting away with this. After she came forward, Awana ended up going to rehab and then to a safe house, but her captor sent two spies after her. Kathy said that for whatever reason, her captor had taken an extra interest in Awana, and these two girls were sent after her and were in an alliance with the captor. He sent the girls to the UN knowing that they would be sent to the same safe house where Awana was, and the plan was to escape and tell the captor where she was. Because she had no country, she was in limbo. She had nowhere to go, so she stayed in Bosnia and went through the court process and testified against her captor. Like I said, she's the first person to do that because she kind of didn't have a choice, but then she did agree to work with the IPTF. Awana went to trauma counseling and thorough preparation to get ready for the trial. She was only 17, with nowhere to go, so they contacted the American Embassy in Bosnia to set up a foster family in the U.S. for her. IPTF Deputy Commissioner Steers, piece of crap, asked Kathy a question, and before I read this quote, I'm going to warn you, it's really upsetting. <sighs> Deputy Commissioner Steers asked Kathy, quote, Why are you wasting so much time on these cases? They're just prostitutes, and there's no way any American family is going to open their door to some hooker, end quote. Excuse me, I get choked up because I get so angry. This was another part that I had to put this book down and, like, take a break and walk away. I just am so furious reading it again. I'm so angry. This attitude is why trafficking victims were being arrested and the captors were just going about business and the trafficking was thriving because these people suck. People like Steers suck. Kathy, who is so much more well-spoken and braver than I could ever be after having that said to her, told Steers, quote, these girls are not prostitutes. They are trafficking victims. There is a huge difference, end quote. And quick note, even if they were sex workers by choice, they are human beings. Full stop. While people have come a long way in the way that we speak about sex workers, there are still people who have that opinion and treat cases involving sex workers as if they are less than human, and we don't do that shit on this podcast. Okay? <sighs> Moving on. In the summer of 2000, as the trial approached, Kathy had to meet with Steers multiple times blech, to arrange security measures for Oana as she was going to and from the courthouse because she was in danger, and I bet you won't be super shocked to hear that he was completely unhelpful. The Minister of the Interior, who was in charge of security and still under investigation for corruption in the Hedziki case, was also very dismissive of Kathy's security needs. Surprise, surprise. The day of the trial, Kathy got an urgent call from Main HQ that Awana's lawyer, Deirdre, needed help immediately. Deirdre was the one who introduced Kathy to Awana and was fighting hard for her. Kathy got to the courthouse and saw Deirdre shielding Awana from four big thugs that were sent by her captor who were just let inside the courthouse 
waiting for Oana and Deirdre to show up, shouting threats. No one had bothered to come up with a security plan for her. No one was there to keep an eye on things. There were no police around the courthouse or in the courthouse. No one was asking for IDs. No one was patted down. And no one was arrested for attempting to intimidate a witness. But yeah, let's go and arrest the women that we find in brothels. I just... (sighs) Oana got through her emotional and extremely draining testimony and then had to leave the courthouse again with no security to a wall of people that were there waiting for her. They were all yelling and threatening things, and one person lifted up his shirt, showing a gun. No one was there to escort any of them out, but they got out of there safely, thank goodness, and on a positive note, after she testified, Oana was able to go to the U.S. to live with a foster family who was more than happy to have her, no thanks to stupid steers, and huge thanks in part to the American ambassador's wife, Bonnie Miller, who was on top of it and very invested in the human rights cases and the work that Kathy was doing. So she was able to set up a foster family for Oana. Again, for every stupid jerk fighting against this movement, there were people in powerful positions, mostly women, who were helping to push it forward. Kathy's six-month extension was flying by. She could sign on to do one more six-month extension, but then she would be required to go back to the U.S. for six months before reapplying. That was a rule that was laid out by DynCorp for their contractors. Things were going in a great direction overall, and Kathy was proud of the work she was doing alongside Madeleine Reese on Bosnia's trafficking and prosecution laws. One roadblock that they ran into again and again was that housing and rehabilitating trafficked women was extremely unsafe and inefficient. And that was a big part of why the survivors didn't want to remain in Bosnia long enough to testify against their captors. By the time they got to a safe house, they'd been through enough and they wanted to get the hell out of there, and I don't blame them. The current safe houses were too easy for captors to find, which we saw in Awana's case, but the alternative was to hire elderly local women to take the girls in, but they were not at all trained to deal with the situation of some crazy intruder showing up and trying to take the girls back or try to intimidate them into not testifying or worse. The trafficking victims often ended up with major health problems and sometimes drug addictions that were forced on them by their captors. Again, this is a very common thing with human trafficking. They will get the victims addicted to drugs, which makes them more compliant, and then they can get to a point where they become so addicted to these drugs, they are willing to go along with whatever the captor expects them to do. Kathy's department was working hard to raise money for a new site where they would build a fully equipped safe house with medical and psychiatric care and security. This was a huge, important task to take on. This was made even more difficult as they were working with local police to come up with a system to transport the girls and women to and from safe houses, uh, to the IPTF offices, and to court dates, because again, they didn't know who they could trust, rightly so, since the uniformed people were often the ones using the brothels and accepting bribes and then performing the raids later on. This made things extra hard on the girls and women trying to get back to their home countries and difficult for the human rights office to know who to trust in local law enforcement. It was a long process of doing things the old-fashioned way without any kind of a background check. They spent a lot of time building that rapport and actual relationships with the officers. This process was slow but very effective, and they were able to get a grasp on which officers could be trusted across the UN, IPTF offices, and the local police. Among all of the awful corruption and lies, there were huge strides being taken to create a safe and effective housing system for these women. During the first week of October 2000, the largest group so far of 16 young women turned up at the IPTF station in Dehob, which is the oldest city in Bosnia and built around a stone fortress dating back to the 13th century. Also, I'm so sorry for my horrendous pronunciations. I promise you I'm trying, but yikes, my American accent. These girls were originally from Moldova, Ukraine, Romania, Croatia, Bosnia, and Belarus, and they were found after police raided the Kent Bar. Most of them were willing and eager to talk, and they gave detailed reports of local and international police who frequented as clients, including specific features like if someone had a gold tooth, what their tattoos were, different uniforms, and they had people's first names. The station commander at the IPTF station in question was a monitor from Spain, and he was particularly interested in one of the 17-year-old girls. Another monitor at the station walked in on an interview where he was sitting knee-to-knee with this girl, holding her hands. After walking in on this situation, the commander tried to persuade the human rights investigator to let him personally drive the girl to the UN headquarters in Sarajevo, and thankfully, someone was doing their jobs here, 
and they turned him down and did not let him. The station commander later admitted that they had been carrying on a quote-unquote relationship. He was written up, and a report that was submitted to the IPTF Internal Affairs Office about this incident was then pulled and thrown away for unexplained reasons. I'll give you a reason. Corruption. This was the largest case implicating IPTF officers and the most detailed. Kathy and her team wrote reports with thorough details from the victims and suggested that maybe they should use a photo lineup using IPTF photo ID badges for each girl to look at to point out the officers that they knew. Kathy and the team already knew that these reports often went missing mysteriously and nothing was done, so they took extra measures and created four different copies of the report. One would stay in Kathy's file that she had created, and then she sent the other three to the Human Rights Office, the Internal Affairs Office, and IPTF Commissioner Corduroy's office. Of course, people had to make things difficult. In particular, two jackasses who a lot of the women in the mission had issues with. First was, of course, Deputy Commissioner Steers, who continued to act like an ass, saying things like, quote, Oh, now we have to be politically correct and call prostitutes trafficking victims. And he referred to the human rights workers as, quote, a bunch of do-good zealots who thought with their hearts instead of their heads, end quote. I will never, in my wildest dreams, understand people who use things like social justice warrior or do-good zealots as an insult. If giving a shit about human beings is wrong, I don't want to be right. Another thorn in their side was the contingent commander, Reed Jones, who had a very gross and inappropriate conversation with Kathy where he hit on her and made very sexual comments at a work event, then I guarantee that she was not the only one who dealt with that from the boys club. After the report was sent to the correct places, an officer took it upon himself to leak confidential information from the report in an email to over 100 people. This person sent an email to about 120 people, most of them American DynCorp monitors, telling them that there had been a raid on, quote, some houses of ill repute, and that a few, quote, ladies of the evening had been taken into custody. In the email, he said, quote, I have been informed that several descriptions were given of American IPTF monitors. Apparently, photo lineups will be made available to witnesses. Then he went on to say that the credibility of these women was in question, as were the, quote, particulars of their employment. Dude, they had exact names and identifying factors before the photo lineup was even brought into an option. The idea that this guy was trying to say that the trafficking victims were unreliable witnesses was a joke. On top of that, he had absolutely no right to send that information and he shouldn't have even had access to it in the first place, let alone putting it in an email. Kathy was shocked and pissed. So she emailed him back and CC'd the human rights bosses, Alexander Meyer Reek and Madeline Reese. And she informed Jones, under the American and international laws, many of these girls were being raped when monitors paid brothel owners for time with them. She sent, quote, Since I am personally working on these issues, I will bust my butt to make sure any U.S. monitor is repatriated or criminally charged if I can prove their involvement, end quote. She also made sure to mention that many of these brothels had cameras, so they had solid proof of the people in question. Jones replied, quote, In defense of any accused American monitor, I will most certainly attack the credibility of any person knowingly allowing herself to be illegally smuggled into this country, end quote. Now, at this point, I was no longer wanting to cry. I wanted to throw the book across the room, but I pressed forward because I knew our best friend Kathy would not let that go. Kathy wrote back, and suggested that maybe she and Jones could get a coffee together and talk about the actual numbers and cases uh, happening. Since, quote, obviously, you are uninformed on the difference between prostitution and trafficking victims. Prostitutes get paid for their services. Girls do not smuggle themselves into this country. Even if they know that they are going to work as a prostitute, they don't expect their passports to be taken, locked up, beaten, starved, end quote. Jones said that he couldn't get coffee because he would be in Paris the next week, quote, probably in a legitimate place of business, end quote. What a dick. And then, and then he insisted that the women were happy to be there and sarcastically wondered how it was that if the IPTF were indeed, quote, so prevalent in these establishments, then why do the girls not whisper in their ears that there is a problem, end quote. This garbage person was a top 
ranking official. The chief of the Human Rights Office, Alexander Meyer Rick, was horrified that Jones was saying those things and at the fact that someone had immediately given that info to Jones without a second thought, which violated the Code of Confidentiality. Jones had no authority to view the report without written approval from Meyer Reek or someone in the Human Rights Office, let alone to go blabbing about it on an email. Alexander told Kathy in an email that he would speak directly to Deputy Commissioner Steers because that was Jones's supervisor, and it was not a great look that they were clearly backing each other up and egging each other on in these replies to Kathy's email. The next morning, Jones sent Kathy an email that said, quote, what I took as good-natured bantering yesterday, you evidently took seriously. And then he apologized and said that it had been his responsibility, quote, to reassure officers not yet named that there would be due process, end quote. Kathy was frustrated, but she felt that the investigation was already in motion. The ball was already rolling, so she tried to let it go. They had a case. They had specific evidence. And now Jones and Sears were trying to cover the asses of everyone involved. She was very confident in their investigation until she went to talk to Linda Blake, who was a Canadian IPTF monitor that was interviewing several of the trafficking victims. Kathy asked how the investigation was going, and right away, Linda was furious. She told Kathy, quote, There is no investigation. An IPTF regional commander from Ireland walked into my office a couple of days ago and demanded to see the file on his officers. He then said that there had been a big misunderstanding in the field and that he had personally handled the situation with the officers and was pulling the investigation, end quote. This officer, again, had no authority to do that, but authority means nothing to these people. Um, Kathy tried to press other human rights investigators to see why it was pulled and by whom, but people were very scared to talk. There were higher-ups who were clearly closing rank and protecting their idiot friends, and the people willing to do the right thing had already stuck their necks out and were now being intimidated into silence because they could lose their jobs back home. This could destroy their careers if those people wanted to. This just pushed Kathy harder. It was so obvious what was going on based on the monitor who was caught in the station with one of the girls, first names correlating with tattoos and other identifying features implicating IPTF monitors and local police and IPTF members were taking bribes from the mafia and raping trafficked women and it was all just right there being brushed under the rug. Kathy thought to herself at this point, quote, why was I being paid taxpayer dollars to collect evidence that I was then forced to suppress? Why should trafficked women risk their lives coming to IPTF, giving us information when we were not going to do anything with it, end quote. On October 9th, 2000, Kathy sent an email that would probably become one of her most remembered events in the course of her life because it sort of changed everything. She sent an email to about 50 mission personnel, including SRGS Klein, with the subject, quote, Do not read this if you have a weak stomach or a guilty conscience. Kathy had had enough at this point. She wanted to get through to them somehow, so she took a big leap and she went for it. In this email, she detailed the steps a woman takes, um, for example, answering a newspaper ad for employment as a waitress, dancer, nanny, or even a prostitute, and then being tricked into leaving her hometown only to end up blindfolded, handcuffed, and smuggled into Bosnia. She described how captors would confiscate their passports, claiming that they would return them only when the women repaid the thousands of dollars spent on their travel and boarding. The only way that they could repay this was through sexual services, and those who would pay the most for those services were internationals. If the girls and women refused, they were starved or beaten or both. She explained that these women were told that if they went to police, they would be arrested for illegal immigration and prostitution, which absolutely did happen. And I'm going to read a portion of her email because it is so perfectly written and a summary just simply won't cover it. The email said, I want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you male and female police and civilian staff who have assisted these women in the reparation program since its inception last year. For those of you who still refer to these women and children as, quote, prostitutes, Maybe a simple definition would help. Prostitute is someone who willingly sells her body for sexual services with actual material or financial gain who is free to quit or leave or say no when they want. Illegal. Trafficker. Someone who buys, sells, transports, enslaves, entices, promises, kidnaps, deceives, assaults, or coerces a person within or across international, state, cantonal, municipal boundaries, or a combination of such, usually organized by more than one person for material gain. Illegal. Trafficking victim. 
Most of the women and children, some of you are referring to as prostitutes. It is time we realized this is serious organized crime making huge amounts of money in this country. We will leave this mission with money in our pockets, medals on our chests, and bars on our collars that we would never have earned in our home countries, departments, or military. Some of us may have had the opportunity of assisting one or two quote-unquote prostitutes get out of a very dangerous and desperate situation. We may even get accused of quote, thinking with our hearts instead of our heads, but at least we were able to think. Snaps for Kathy. Seriously? An icon. The reaction to this email was mixed. Kathy got several emails back the next day. Some people were thanking her for her courage and professionalism and agreed with her message and fully backed her up. However, her supervisor, Alexander Meyer Reek, emailed, quote, Kathy, this was not a good idea. Can we please discuss? End quote. She went to talk to him right away, and when she got to his office, he was clearly exhausted, and he told Kathy that she should have talked to him before sending the email and said that Commissioner Corduroy and Deputy Commissioner Steers were very upset. She was surprised that he said that Corduroy was upset because he had actually sent Kathy an email thanking her for her work and said that he wanted to talk more with her about her thoughts on this matter. As for Steers, of course Steers was upset, because he sucks. Steers was obviously butthurt because Kathy had called him out and used his exact phrase, the whole thinking with your heart instead of your head thing, and she was fighting back when he was trying to get her to shut up. Steers wanted to meet with Kathy and told Alexander that he wanted Kathy sent back to the U.S. and said that he had gotten the U.S. State Department involved. Kathy was shocked about Steers' claim that the U.S. State Department was involved and asked Alexander to go with her to talk to him, but he declined, saying that it was out of his hands at that point. Kathy would have to fight for herself against someone who was being awful and shady and using their position of power to their own advantage, and was threatening Kathy's job, who was simply defending her job and the people that Steers was crapping all over. Kathy knew that this couldn't be going anywhere good, so she had a legal rep from Madeline's office go with her, and Steers insisted that the legal rep had to wait outside his office while he talked to Kathy. While Kathy waited outside of his office, Steers's secretary quietly told her, quote, I just want you to know all of the secretaries think your email is the bravest thing anyone has ever done in this mission, end quote. Right around this time, Kathy was supposed to be going home to the U.S. for a two-week vacation, and then she would return to Bosnia to finish up her six-month extension. Steers brought this up in their meeting and essentially told her that he was trying to get her fired. He told her, quote, You have used very bad judgment. I understand you are scheduled to take a vacation home for a couple of weeks. Well, when you return, you won't have your job. For your own benefit. I have convinced the commissioner and the State Department to allow me to deal with this as an American thing. Do you have anything to say for yourself? End quote. First of all, you're calling out Kathy for her bad judgment when you do what you do? And also, from what I understand, Steers hadn't actually gotten anyone involved as far as the State Department. I think that was more of an intimidation tactic. Personally, Kathy had plenty that she would have liked to say, but she told him she had nothing to say and left his office. The following weeks, months, and years would be a whirlwind for Kathy as she dealt with the fallout from sending that email. And in my opinion, it seems like she was getting too close to uncovering a pile of corruption and the boys club decided that they needed to do something about it. Which is where we will pick up for part two. Make sure that you are subscribed on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And I will see you for part two next week. Until then, don't stop, quote unquote, thinking with your heart instead of your head. I will talk to you very soon. Bye.